Welcome to today's call. Insurrection at the Capitol. Where do we go from here? Uh, I am Russ Feingold, the president of the American Constitution Society. We are all grieving today. We are grieving the loss of life and the reality that the foundations of our democracy appear shaky at best. For the first time since the War of 1812, our Capitol building, our Citadel of Liberty that I was honored and humbled to work in for close to two decades, was under siege just 48 hours ago, egged on by President Trump's refusal to accept his electoral defeat. This was an attack on the very foundations of our democracy. Make no mistake, these were not protesters. These were rioters incited to violence by government officials. In the wake of this assault, we have to ask, what's next? How do we recover from this assault? How do we heal our democracy and punish those responsible? Both those who physically breached the Capitol walls and those who incited the violence. Should the president be removed from office? and what can and should be done in response to law enforcement's relative inaction in the face of mobs who infiltrated the Capitol complex as compared to the treatment of Black Lives protesters last year. At this moment of crisis, the work of ACS has never been more vital. So I'm really thankful to our speakers for agreeing to participate in this call today on very short notice and to all of you for being with us. So now I'm gonna turn it over to ACS's Director of Policy and Program, Deborah Perlin. Thanks for putting this together so quickly and effectively, Deborah, and you will get the conversation started. Thank you. Thanks so much, Russ. Um, two quick housekeeping notes before we get started. First, please note that today's call is being recorded and the recording will be available after the call. Second, if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the call, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking questions after our presenters are finished with their remarks and we'll try to address as many as possible. We are so glad that Professor Steve Laddick and Professor um, Cami Chafis have agreed to be with us today. We will first hear from Professor Vladek. Professor Vladek is the A. Dalton Cross Professor in Law at the University of Texas School of Law, where he focuses on issues of constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. Professor Vladek's scholarship has been featured in an array of legal publications, including the, including the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, and his popular writing has appeared in forums ranging from the New York Times to BuzzFeed News. Together with Professor Bob Chasney, he is also the co-host of the popular National Security Law Podcast. And perhaps most importantly for our purposes, we at ACS are also proud to have him as a member of our ACS's Board of Academic Advisors. Professor Vladek will walk us through the constitutional questions related to presidential removal and the national security questions raised by Wednesday's mob. After Steve, we'll hear from Professor Chafis. Professor Chafis is a professor of law and director of the criminal justice program at Wake Forest University School of Law, where her scholarship focuses on issues related to criminal law, criminal procedure, and criminal justice reform. A frequent contributor to national and international media outlets, her writings have appeared in the New York Times and Huffington Post, among others. Professor Chafis is a former assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and importantly for our purposes, the faculty advisor for the Wake Forest ACS Students Chapter. She'll talk about the prosecutorial options for the rioters and police conduct and misconduct issues. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Vladek. Great, thank you, Deborah. Um, thanks, Cammie, it's great to see you guys. Russ too, um, I wish we were under better circumstances, but um, still nice to, to, to see some friendly faces. So um, we really do wanna leave as much time as possible for discussion and Q&A. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly through some of the big questions, um, leaving I think some of the more important criminal law questions to Cami. But so with regard to what happened on Wednesday, you know, let me talk about some of the sort of big picture eye-dropping federal criminal possibilities, um, right? So um, some folks on the internet are wondering, you know, well, was it treason? Um, that one's easy, no. Um, we're not at war. Um, there's no other side that these folks were aligning themselves with or fighting on behalf of. Um, what they were doing was far more uh, classically understood as what many are calling it, which is insurrection. And here's how uh, the U.S. Code defines insurrection. It's 18 U.S.C. Section 2383. 
and it says, whoever incites, sets on foot, assists, or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States, um, right? And so the insurrection, right, is attempting to overthrow the authority of the federal government, attempting to um, use force um, to resist and subvert the democratic government. Um, what makes this different, of course, is that it was not just a riot. It was an assault on Congress in the middle of the joint session that was specifically meeting for the purpose of confirming um, who exactly will hold the authority of the United States on January 20th. Um, that's really why this is so, at least legally, categorically different from, you know, some of the acts of violence we saw over the past six, seven months, you know, in other cities. Um, the other statute that I think folks are talking about, at least from the national security law side of things, and again, there's a, a raft of other offenses that I know Cammy's going to say a bit about, um, is seditious conspiracy. Um, seditious conspiracy is if two or more persons in any state um, conspire to overthrow, put down, or destroy by force the government of the United States or to levy war against them or to oppose by force the authority thereof or by force to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States. Um, you know, I've, I've been pretty careful in my career and especially over the last four years in trying to sort of not use these terms to describe some of what we've seen. Um, Wednesday comes about as close to an example of seditious conspiracy as we've seen in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, it's hard to imagine what would be a seditious conspiracy under Section 2384 if some of what we saw on Wednesday was not. Not all of it, of course, just some of it. Um, all right, so that's, I, I want to leave Cammie, who's the real expert for the rest of the criminal law side. Let me turn to what else might be going on. Um, remedies against those who might be responsible, right? Remedies against political actors. Um, so, of course, for the members of Congress, um, for whom many, you know, me, many find responsible for, if not um, um, the violence itself and for encouraging it, for supporting it, you know, the classic remedy is expulsion, um, right? That Article 1, Section uh, section 3 provides for the expulsion, uh, Section 7, sorry, provides for the expulsion of members um, upon a two-thirds vote of either chamber. Um, and there's already been at least some discussion um, by some members of both the House and the Senate that the, uh, I think it's 138 members of the House and eight senators who voted to sustain objections to Biden's electors in Arizona and Pennsylvania should be expelled. Um, I suspect that's not gonna go anywhere, but it's at least a conversation worth having. Um, there's been some discussion also about section three of the 14th amendment, um, which provides that individuals who have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States um, may not hold office. Uh, and especially may not serve as senators or legislators. Legislators um, I, here, I think you know. First of all, Section Three, when it has been used, which was principally after the Civil War, is usually used as a basis for not seating a member when they are elected. It's not usually a basis on its own, separate from the power to expel provided by Article One. I also think it's a bit of a stretch to show that the you know the members were themselves engaged in the insurrection. Um, even if we think that they did not nearly enough to preclude it um, and that some of their rhetoric may have helped to provoke it. Um, and then, of course, we get to the, the, the question of the day, which is what about the president? Um, and with regard to the president, there are, of course, two remedies if he won't resign himself. Um, there is the impeachment remedy. We've already heard um, that articles of impeachment have been introduced in the House. Um, I believe the House is planning to vote on, uh, to, to, to debate the articles and perhaps even vote on them as early as next week. Um, and then, of course, there's a specter of a Senate trial. Um, and part of why I think folks are especially harping upon the impeachment remedy, even with only 12 days left in the president's tenure, um, is because one of, the, one of the consequences of a successful removal from the Senate um, can be permanent disqualification from ever holding another office under the United States. Um, and so, although there's some debate in the literature about whether that's automatic if the Senate votes to remove or whether the Senate actually has to take a second vote, it's certainly at least on the table that even if this may seem like the clock is running out and the president's going to be out of office by the time the Senate's done, there's still a downstream potential consequence, a downstream potential remedy that might make it worth pursuing. Uh, and it certainly at least would make it a live issue even after January 20th. Um, but part of why I think there's been a lot of discussion of the 25th Amendment is because even that process will take some time. Um, and for those who are worried that the president should be immediately removed from power, um, the only constitutional mechanism is Section 4 of the 25th Amendment. But of course, that requires the vice president and a majority of, not the, not the cabinet, but a majority of department heads 
Um, so not the entire cabinet, the CIA director doesn't count, but rather the 15 department heads. So eight of the 15 to send a letter to Congress saying that they do not believe the president is, uh, is any longer able to discharge the duties of his office. Of course, the president can then send his own letter saying, actually, I'm fine. Um, and then there would have to be a second letter from the vice president and a majority of the department heads. And here's where things get interesting. Um, the timeline from there as set forth in the 25th Amendment is that Congress must meet within 48 hours um, to debate whether the vice president should become the acting president or whether the president should be restored to office. And it must decide that question within 21 days. But the 25th Amendment also makes clear that until Congress decides the question, the acting president is the vice president, right? That is to say, the second letter from the vice president removes the president from power temporarily, at least until Congress votes. Um, and this is, I think, why a lot of folks think this is worth discussing right now, because that would be both an immediate remedy and Congress could then simply run out the clock. Um, that as opposed to even having to vote on whether the president should be permanently removed from office, if we hit noon on January 20th, that matter becomes moot. Um, so, you know, these are obviously not exactly topics that we thought we'd have to discuss on a regular basis. Um, they're immensely grave. Um, none of them should be considered lightly. But, you know, the, the mechanisms are not powerless when it comes to what to do in a situation like this. Um, and so I think one of the real questions is whether there's the political will to pursue some of these mechanisms because the legal mechanisms, the legal tools really are there. Um, reports from earlier today are that the vice president has no interest. Um, in invoking the 25th Amendment. I think Secretary Carson put out a statement that he has no interest in, you know, fault pursuing a 25th Amendment remedy. Um, so that's probably just still an academic discussion for the moment, but at the risk of, of being a bit of a sort of, you know, worrier, um, there are still 12 days um, until the president's no longer the president. And, you know, there's no reason to believe that what happened on Wednesday is the last time he's going to do something wholly unbecoming his office before he no longer holds it. Um, so I'm going to sort of stop there, even though there's so much more to discuss, because I want to get out of the way and, and turn the floor over to Cami. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And, and thank you, uh, Russ and, and Deborah, for, uh, for inviting me to this uh, discussion. Um, you know, so I agree with everything um, that, that Steve uh, has said, and I have kind of a few points that I want to move through. Um, uh, you know, first there are the the lower level crimes that I want. You know, we want to discuss and some of the nuances um, regarding some of the the charges there. Um, and I want to talk about the importance of bringing those individuals uh, to to justice because we haven't seen, um, relatively speaking, we haven't seen um, a, a, a lot. Uh, of arrests when we look at the number of people that were there and, and the damage that was done and we uh, know uh, that was uh, perpetrated. So I wanna talk about the importance of bringing um, those folks to justice and a little bit about uh, how prosecutors might uh, do that, the evidence and things that they would use. Um, but, and, and then I wanna talk about uh, understanding how it is that so many of these crimes that the rioters had the opportunity to commit so many of, of these crimes. What we were looking at is um, what we saw on January 6th was a systemic security breach. Those in the world of, of police accountability, we always know that an individual officer is responsible for their actions, um, but uh, you know, in terms of any use of force that's used or or, or not used. Um, but what we saw here was a little bit different. We we ha they have some systemic failures, and we know that these um, failures are usually rooted in an organizational culture, uh, and we look to uh, top leadership. So we will need to find out what happened, what's going on within, in particular, the the Capitol Police. Um, in particular, and so that we can rectify it uh, moving forward. Um, and then finally, I do want to spend some time analyzing and thinking about the appalling disparities that we saw uh, between how law enforcement 
uh, interacted with these uh, rioters and how they handled, how again, the same agencies handled the largely peaceful Black Lives Matter protests this spring uh, and summer. And again, uh, the disparities, we can, we can talk about them. They are, uh, they were there, but it's more important to understand why we have to uh, address it and the impact that seeing those disparities um, is, can have uh, on our democracy. So first, when you think about the crimes, uh, you know, Steve's talked about the uh, seditious conspiracy and, um, and, 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 and the like, but a lot of the protesters uh, and, and I don't want to call them protesters. Many of them were uh, certainly were uh, rioters. I mean, we have a litany. If you think about uh, issue spotting for a, a criminal law exam, uh, you would not be able to, to discuss all of the crimes that uh, that we saw committed. Um, but prosecutors are going to have to sit down and they're going to have to go through. Um, there's uh, unlawful entry, I mean, you, in, into uh, the, the federal uh, building there, um, felony theft, um, felony destruction of property, assault on federal law enforcement officers. We saw uh, and I've seen the video, I know we all have seen uh, multiple videos, but there are, are, were uh, Capitol police officers just, you know, holding barriers and there were um, uh, uh, rioters who actively went up and, and punched them and shoved them. Um, and I, I have to step back and also communicating threats. And this is a, something really interesting. Um, I, I did uh, prosecute uh, cases in Washington, D.C. and communicating threats. When I worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office, you could, this is a crime, you know, sometimes, it, well, it's a misdemeanor. You could spend up to six months in jail for saying you were going to beat up so-and-so or kick so-and-so's, you know what. Um, and unfortunately, these charges disproportionately, again, um, reserved or leveled against um, racial minorities. And I'm sure there's some statistics that would bear that out, but we certainly saw communicating uh, threats um, at the very least um, at, on, on Capitol Hill that day. Um, and then there are, you know, um, the, the pipe bombs that uh, were placed, that were, that were found. Uh, again, is this, um, uh, you know, attempted murder charges. Um, and then, uh, sadly, um, there were deaths uh, that were uh, caused as a as a direct result of uh, of the protests and of the security breach. So you have um, the uh, protester that the rioter that entered uh, the uh, Capitol building and was shot by um, I believe it was probably Capitol Police or maybe Secret Service. We we don't know uh, yet. Maybe until the investigation is full. But it was a law enforcement officer that's been placed on administrative leave and. You with with that, you know, are there felony murder charges that are available uh, to, again to prosecute those uh, who were also in in the rotunda at that uh, point? Um, and then again, sadly, this morning we learned that uh, Officer Brian Seidnick was uh, injured and succumbed to his injuries. And so um, there's uh, absolutely a uh, homicide charge that prosecutors uh, should be looking into. And uh, as well as, uh, again, the possibility of felony murder charges, depending on uh, what the circumstances were and who was around. So uh, a litany uh, of charges and when we, of possible charges. And when we think about this, if we go back to first principles, um, I uh, always tell my uh, criminal law students, um, you know, you can't punish, if the punishment um, would not align with the first, uh, the underlying theories of punishment, right? Um, utilitarianism or retribution, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't punish, you shouldn't engage in it. But here it's so important that we understand um, the utilitarian principles, uh, it is specifically specific deterrence and general deterrence. Um, what we saw uh, unfold uh, and, and the mob, we cannot have these same individuals, many of, many of whom uh, are known uh, to the general public on uh, their faces and their social media, we cannot have them go uh, unpunished for their deeds if we're able to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt, because they will, uh, what, what will prevent them from going to a state capital uh, or uh, other state buildings or, come, or federal buildings again and engaging in the same behavior? 
if, uh, if they're not punished. And again, general deterrence, we have to, you, you have to send a message that you can peacefully protest, but uh, when, when it crosses the line uh, to uh, assaulting officers and uh, felony, you know, in destruction of property, and then um, the, the, the huge uh, national security interests that are implicated here. This wasn't just any building. This was a building and they interrupted or disrupted the business uh, of Congress. And so, and that's another actual federal statute and, and crime uh, under which they can be uh, prosecuted. So um, uh, how will, uh, you know, various law enforcement agencies go about um, prosecuting and finding these uh, people? The investigations, um, I think, are um, you know, it's easy for us to, to sit back and, 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 and criticize and say, oh, they're, they're going too slow. But my hope and my faith uh, in many of the career prosecutors um, that we have uh, and in the FBI is that they are going to be combing the uh, social media, um, uh, using all the tools available uh, to law enforcement um, to identify these uh, these these people and uh, to appropriately assess their um, their roles uh, in in the mayhem that happened. Um, but uh, the the other thing that we have to to think about is again um, how did this occur? And we had so many. Uh, officers injured, um, uh, again, uh, you, you know, the, the systemic failures and the lack of uh, preparedness um, that we saw with the, the federal uh, agencies. There, there was not only a systemic failure among uh, one agency, but the lack of coordination uh, amongst the, the, uh, the agencies as well that we didn't see, and this is the question, this is why there should be an independent investigation that we didn't see in, um, in, in other, uh, in the Black Lives Matter protest um, this summer, but we can even think back to the J-20 um, uh, protests when uh, President uh, Trump was first inaugurated, uh, I recall the DC police, uh, Metropolitan Police, using a tactic called kettling, where they would uh, round up uh, mass numbers of protesters and, uh, and, and, and put them in a certain place. Now, the problem, and constitutionally, was that a lot of a mass arrests occurred, and a lot of people were arrested who, uh, you, there was not problem cause to believe that they had actually engaged in some of the crimes. Um, we have a lot less of that here because we, when you see people breaching um, the, the, the Capitol building and uh, again, so uh, and some, some active um, resistance to uh, and, and disobeying uh, law enforcement's uh, orders. So, um, so the use of police tactics, was it a failure in training? Um, as well. And again, so I, I'm calling for an independent um, investigation. I say independent because, um, again, there will be a segment of society that doesn't trust or doesn't believe that this happened. And we, we really uh, want people to understand that um, uh, that a, a fair and impartial investigation uh, took place um, and into what happened. And finally, um, I will just leave uh, with the, the disparities um, that that we saw and the way in which uh, protesters um, had had been treated. Because um, it, that's not to say if we could think about ratcheting up. It's not to say, well, you know. Um, you, you treated the Black Lives Matter protesters this way, so we should ratchet up and treat these people you know, in the same way. If they were peacefully protesting, um, you, you wouldn't want to see um, that, that ratcheting up. You'd want to have um, the, the protections that, we, uh, that they would deserve. But there's um, a marked difference here between the behavior, the largely peaceful protest that we saw this summer and the behavior that was displayed um, on Capitol Hill January 6th. Um, and it's also um, what we know in terms of when we think about uh, police accountability, uh, officers are allowed to use force as a part of their uh, jobs. It's just that that force has to be reasonable. And so often, uh, a police officer only has to say, I feared for my life. 
I, I feared for my life. And so they're able to uh, shoot with you know, impunity um, a, a, a black or brown uh, person um, and, and face no consequences uh, because it would be deemed reasonable. But what we saw uh, on Capitol Hill January 6th is that police can and do use restraint in certain uh, circumstances. And the fact that we had, and it, 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 one death is too many, but the fact that there weren't more uh, deaths is, uh, uh, again, it's, it's, it's very surprising, uh, but it also shows the restraint that they were able to show. And, and we have to ask, why, why isn't that uh, reserved? Why is that reserved for these uh, rioters uh, and, you know, potentially seditious conspirators, uh, rather than a black man, Andre Hill, in his garage, in, in, in a neighbor's garage, and simply turning around, he's immediately gunned down. And so the, the last, you know, re, a lot of surveys um, will show that, you know, like a recent Pew survey, 79% um, of Blacks say that they feel uh, that the criminal justice system treats them differently. Um, and, 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 and we see this. And so we are, cannot afford to have, again, the legitimacy of our institutions continually questioned. So we have to have an independent investigation as to what happened. Um, and now we, we know that, that police officers can uh, and do, well, we've always known, I'll say this uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll conclude, but uh, we've always known that um, restraint uh, can be shown, and there are some jurisdictions that say you don't have you you don't have to um, uh, shoot first and, and ask questions later. You can uh, actually exhaust all of your other remedies. There's been so much resistance to changing use of force policies in local communities to that standard to say that you. You don't have to resort to deadly force. You should exhaust all of your uh, possibilities. And we saw that in action uh, on Capitol Hill. So I think uh, many members of the Black community would say, and, and so why not that for our communities? Thank you. Thank you so much for both to both of you for getting this conversation started. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in in the chat, and I just kind of want to bring it into our conversation. Um, so the first one has to do with, um, I didn't know about this. There was an article that Josh Blackman, I guess, wrote this week arguing that Trump cannot be impeached for inciting Wednesday's assault on the Capitol because the First Amendment um, protects his speech. And I was just wondering if either of you could respond to that. It may be that, I don't know if Cammy or Steve wants to take that one. You're, you're laughing, Cammy. <laughs> um. <laughs> it's just wrong. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's, a, it's a blog post on Vol Conspiracy this morning by Josh and by Seth Barrett Tillman. Um, and it's just wrong. I mean, it's wrong on the facts, it's wrong on the law, it's wrong on the historical precedent. Um, impeachment is not limited to criminal offenses. If it were, then the president could not be impeached, even though he takes no action to repel a foreign invasion. Um, I think that would surprise the founders quite a bit, um, right? Um, and, you know, that. I, so put that aside. But let's indulge the hypothetical for a second and say, all right, well, what if, what if that were some never before understood constraint on the impeachment power? Um, first of all, it wouldn't be enforceable. Congress decides what are high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, the courts stay out. The Supreme Court held in 1993 that impeachments are not subject to judicial review. Um, but second, you know, I don't, I don't want to give up the ghost that the president didn't commit incitement. I mean, I think it would be very hard to prove in a court of law. Um, and you know, I, I hope Cammy can follow up on this because you know she has more experience in the trenches on this than I do. Um, I think it would be hard to prove the elements in a court of law. I think the president would have, you know, at least the uh, um, a plausible, if not merit, if not meritorious, First Amendment defense. Um, but in context, everything he said at the rally, um, right, his tweets, um, what he has, you know, what he what he tweeted while the the insurrection was ongoing, um, you know, the Brandenburg test is stringent, but it's not impossible. Um, and so, you know, even in a world in which you actually had to show incitement as a prerequisite, or you had to show a criminal offense as a prerequisite, um, you know, I, I I think there's at least a non-laughable case to make. Um, that the president is is certainly walked right up to the line um, in his remarks, both in person and online on Wednesday. But I'm, I'm curious what Cammy thinks. 
Yeah, I, I, I think, again, you know, diff difficult to prove and the incit uh, incitement. Um, so I would I would agree with you, Steve. And, you know, we also have to think about some with, with some of these. Um, so uh, a lot of these charges, you know, I mean, these uh, folks were there and they were there um, at the, you know, at the Capitol and they traveled. Um, and so they didn't just hear that some of them, I'm sure, didn't just hear this speech and, and go down there. They had brought with them weapons um and 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 in and, and, you know again there are two pipe pipe bombs uh that have been constructed and and um and left so there's a, a fair amount of, of of premeditation that um was happening pre preparation um that was happening beforehand as well so i'm quite sure that there's some folks who didn't need that um uh level of uh of of, of assistance and, and encouragement but um i do think that um the words and particularly the words of um Ru uh, rudy giuliani who said trial you know trial by combat i i don't know um how uh, Com combat is pretty unequivocal and unequivocal that's a that's a great word <laughs> yeah it's uh, you know there's so the, the president's words i find um abhorrent but more um but a, a bit more ambiguous rudolph giuliani's um you know uh, trial by combat is pretty clear I mean, we should say that you know the Justice Department said earlier today that it's not pursuing any charges relating to anything that was said at the rally. Um, and I, I want to say I don't have a problem with that because you know I, it's there are lots of examples of things that I think are illegal and shouldn't be prosecuted. Um, and and this is this to me is a textbook case of what was said at the rally as opposed to everything that happened thereafter. Um, you know, and, and I think that's you know the other part of this also is just to, to to go back to the original question just for a second, Deborah. You know, I think there's still a lot more to learn about what was told to the military, to the DC National Guard. Um, you know, both leading up to and during the day on Wednesday. I mean, if the if the reports, you know, Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, who's a Republican, um, if his version of events is accurate as he's as he's explained it, um, then there wasn't just um, negligence on the part of the federal government. There was a deliberate non-response. Um, and, I, you know, the notion that that would not be something Congress could impeach a president for, I think, is just um, to describe it is to is to is to is to condone it. Yeah, and I guess there's also a debate, right, of just because if something may or may not be criminal doesn't mean they, the president can or cannot be impeached over it, right? He can be potentially impeached over something that's. Well, the other thing is, I mean, and, and even if I mean, even if you believe that the text of the Constitution, by limiting impeachment to cases of high crimes or other misdemeanors, thereby actually does impose a requirement that there be a crime, um, that's a requirement enforced by the House and the Senate and nobody else. Um, and so, you know, if if a majority of the House and two thirds of the Senate believe that particular conduct meets the constitutional definition, that's the end of the matter so far as the Constitution is concerned. I just want to pick up on something you were saying, Steve, about the um, if Sen um, Governor Hogan's version of events of what happened. If maybe we could talk for a second about kind of the the jurisdictional issues that are at play. I mean, DC is a non-state, um, and so um, how kind of the interplay in terms of law enforcement and where the legal authorities and jurisdictional overlays kind of come into play in protecting the capital and DC in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that this came up in a couple of the questions in the thread because I was hoping we'd get to it. You know, wholly apart from who can be like prosecuted for things that happened on Wednesday, I, I have some tough questions about exactly why the law enforcement response broke down. And Deborah, part of it could be related to the inner jurisdictional cluster, you know what, um, that is law enforcement in D.C. I mean, so just to, to sort of set the stage a bit, right, the Capitol Police are principally responsible for securing and policing the Capitol grounds. Um, but there are, I, Cammie might know the statistic, I, it's like 38 federal agencies with law enforcement authority somewhere in the District of Columbia, um, right? That's, you know, and then there's DC. Um, and the, the, the MPD, the Metropolitan Police Department, in general does not have the authority to police on the Capitol grounds unless they're invited, unless they're requested onto the grounds, but they were on Wednesday. Um, and indeed, my understanding is that MPD was instrumental in actually clearing out the building. Um, so this creates a whole bunch of questions. Um, right. Um, first, there's a question of where was the National Guard, uh, right? Um, in most states, if this had happened, you would have seen an immediate activation of the National Guard by the relevant governor. Um, D.C. is the only jurisdiction in the country where the local government does not control the National Guard. 
Um, and you guys might say, well, that's because it's not a state. Well, neither is Puerto Rico or Guam or the U.S. Virgin Islands. And those governors control their National Guards. Um, rather, this is actually a sort of quirky old remnant of a time before D.C. had a local government. Um, right? D.C. only had a local government since the 1970s, I think 1970 specifically. So um, the D.C. Guard is under the control of the president and the secretary of defense. Um, and there are going to be a lot of questions about why they weren't out in much more armed force sooner. Um, the Maryland and Virginia guards, right, are under the control of the governors of Maryland and Virginia, respectively, but they can't be sent into DC unless one of two things happen, unless they're requested by the federal government or unless they're requested by the mayor under something called the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding from the Governor Hogan's interviews, at least, is that um, EMAC was not activated by the mayor. Um, rather, they were going through the Defense Department and DOD was dragging its heels. So, um, you know, Deborah, I have a lot of questions about exactly why they were caught so unprepared. Um, I, I saw a quote today from, I think, an FBI official in a briefing that they just didn't have intelligence um, um, that, you know, tipping them off that this was in the cards. Um, do they not read the Internet? Um, right. I mean, are they not on parlor? Um, that seems like a rather significant intelligence failure. So there are a lot of failures here that I think are also part of the conversation, although less immediately, I guess. Right, and, and I wanna uh, just piggyback on, on something that, that Steve said, you know, yes, um, there are all of these uh, agencies that have the you know, jurisdictional authority and, and for different things. You have the park uh, police, you have a, each agency has um, its own. Uh, but, um, but Washington, D.C., this is a protest. Uh, Washington, D.C. is not a city that is not used to handling large and complicated protests. Uh, large and complicated gatherings. Um, they do it all the time and we don't see this. Um, and that's not to say that we don't see some level uh, of, um, you know, of, of folks getting uh, out of hand, but we've never had a, a building breached um, in, in this way. So uh, I, I have to believe that the, that, that, part of the failure was uh, deliberate. And it was, um, and it placed, not only did it place um, the, uh, some of the protesters, some rioters, right? They're not, uh, they're both mixed in there. Not only did it place them in danger, it placed the, the officers themselves uh, in danger. And we've lost uh, one officer and um, others, dozens uh, injured. And, and now we, ha and we have several deaths. So it uh, and, and and Congress and the members of our um, of of our legislative branch and they're you know conducting their business. So these um, they're fit. This is not an innocuous oh you know um, that kind of thing. And and to your point about the intelligence, um, this also we have um, you know we need to begin to pay more attention to the rise of uh, these insurrectionist uh, movements. Um, there, uh, there's, there's, should be plenty of, uh, intelligence available to our federal law enforcement, um, uh, authorities, uh, about a lot of the white supremacist groups that were there, the militia movements that were represented and that are organizing, um, themselves, right? You have a, a, a right to assemble, but you do not have a right to, uh, to, to, to come and commit this type of, of mayhem that, that happened on January 6th. So let's turn for a second to continue this conversation. Let's talk a little about redress, right? So if we actually do want to get to the bottom of what happened and we want to investigate and prevent something similar from happening, what is kind of the most effective accountability mechanisms that we can use moving forward? Uh, Deborah, that's a big question because it's about so much more than Wednesday. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's sort of, there, there are the small oversight questions from Wednesday, and then there are the big oversight questions from Wednesday. And, you know, when Cami talks about the intelligence failures, um, you know, that's about a lot more than Wednesday, right? Why, why do we have the Department of Homeland Security busy looking into, you know, social media of reporters covering the Portland protests, but unable to figure out that this was going to happen? I mean, that's, that's, you know, how that can happen, I think is a, is a big question. Um, I, you know, the first thing I should say is I, I think it's worth stressing that a heck of a lot of people are being arrested, um, right? That that despite what the reports might look like on Wednesday, um, there have been you know dozens and dozens and dozens of arrests today, yesterday. There will be more 
Um, and there are, you know, there are going to be hundreds of criminal prosecutions forthcoming. And we're going to learn a fair amount from that because there are going to be a lot of folks in a position to trade information to the government in exchange for leniency. Um, but we need some robust congressional oversight. Um, I would love to get behind the idea of some kind of 9-11 commission style joint bi bipartisan effort. Um, but bipartisan means bipartisan, and that means senior Republicans endorsing such an enterprise, which would require senior Republicans to admit that the president lost the election. Um, and that, you know, the, the 138 members of the House and the eight senators who voted to reject Arizona's and Pennsylvania's Biden electors, admitting that they actually had no good faith basis for doing that. Um, so, you know, this is, I think this is the trick going forward, which is, you know, how much is going to be able to be done through bipartisanship and how much is going to require Democrats taking advantage of the fact that at least as of January 20th, they're going to control the political branches. And I think that's, that's a very hard call and depends to at least some degree on Republicans as much as it depends upon Democrats. Yeah, I, I agree, Bi uh, must be uh, uh, bipartisan, but also um, when we think about uh, the uh, what happened at the Capitol, again, we've got 50 state capitals, we've got uh, state governments, and we saw what happened in Michigan um, with with the governor and um, the plot uh, there that was that was uncovered. But uh, we have to make sure that I mean, um, you know, hate crimes, bias crimes, um, and and insurrection and the rise of uh, militia groups. It's been happening. People have been warning uh, for the last ten years or more that that. Um, there's an, an increase here. And so we need to, uh, again, devote our federal resources to honestly to looking in our own backyard um, at, at home um, in domestic terrorism. I just want to return the conversation a little bit to kind of the, the news of the day, right? President Trump still being in office conversations about the 25th Amendment, there's conversation about impeachment, and while a few Republicans have kind of come around to those ideas a lot, have not. Um, Lindsey Graham actually has a quote saying that if the president does anything else, quote, all options should be on the table. Um, but that still gives us 12 days. So in the next 12 days, if President Trump were to give an order that people of conscience didn't want to follow, what are the options that exist um, for while he's still in office, if such an order were given, if any. So, I mean, if, Deborah, seemingly you mean in the military, right? Um, so the yes. you know the the folks have been talking about this for a while, unfortunately, and hoping that it was just an academic conversation, and here we are, and it's not. Um, so, it's tricky because you know the the story, for example, about Speaker Pelosi calling the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and making sure the president didn't have the authority to launch nuclear weapons. Um, the chairman can't disobey a lawful order from the president of the United States. Um, not only, not, I mean, he's committing a felony if he does, um, right? And so, you know, the, the military is supposed to have the power to disobey unlawful orders, um, but that puts a heck of a lot of pressure on them in the moment to determine, you know, which orders are lawful and which ones are not. Now, I have a ton of faith in our military, um, perhaps more faith than I should. Um, but I also think that's a, you know, we should not be too comfortable in the idea that it's going to be clear in the moment which orders are lawful and which are not. If the president turns around and says, I want to, I want to launch a nuclear, you know, weapon at Iran right now, you know, that might be an easy call for the military, but there's a heck of a lot of stuff short of that, um, right? If the president wants to deploy the military in and around D.C. on January 17th um, in response to what I gather is going to be the next big, you know, gathering of, of his supporters. Um, is that an unlawful order? I don't think so, right? So, you know, I think there are real vulnerabilities in the chain of command that underscore the push for some action before the 20th, right? That, that, that underscore why there are a lot of people who don't think the Lindsey Graham, Bob Corker view that we should just, you know, 12 days is a short period of time. Um, a lot can happen in 12 days and the president is still the president until he's not. Cammy, did you want to add anything or? Okay. Um, so part of why people I think are still talking about impeachment is not just for the 12 days, but also disqualification from future office, potentially disqualification from future office. Are, is there any other way, any other mechanism to disqualify someone from holding future office outside of kind of the impeachment and then that subsequent vote? The only one I know of is um, 
there's one or two criminal statutes and the insurrection statute is one of them. Um, I, want, I want to get the text right, so bear with me for a second. But the insurrection statute says, um, if you're convicted of this offense, you shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. Um, now that's narrower than section three of the 14th Amendment. Section three of the 14th Amendment also applies to state offices. Um, but there are at least a couple of statutes that bring with them disqualification for holding future office. Of course, these are statutes that have pretty high proof thresholds, right? These are not going to be the, the easier ones to, to prove from what from one state's events. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, again, those um, few uh, statutes that that would prohibit you from holding um, an office. But I think, again, the, the importance when, in thinking about impeachment, you know, yes, it can be, a, you know, a, a long and, and grueling process, not even sure that we could get um, the Senate uh, vote uh, on that, right? The two thirds uh, majority required something, but um, but to make sure that this person um, cannot, you know, uh, run for office and exact the the, the type of damage um, to our our institutions again would be uh, important. So, so in addition to um, President Trump, I mean, it would be great to hear your thoughts about kind of what options are available for members of Congress potentially as well who have culpability for Wednesday's attack expulsion. Are there other kind of statutes or mechanisms that should be under consideration and who those should apply to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think this is, this is a, I mean, so to what extent are we going to hold political leaders responsible, right? So, you know, the, I think we've, I think we're up to, I think 10 state representatives have been identified among the, 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 the video of the rioters from Wednesday. Um, there are mechanisms under, I think most states laws for removing members. I think maybe even every state's law for removing members of the state legislature. Um, you know, I think it's, that's a, that's a conversation to be had on the state by state level. Um, but, you know, I also think there ought to be a fair amount of pressure on these folks to resign. Um, I mean, Senator Murray, who is not exactly one for hyperbole, um, was I think the, the first prominent sitting Democratic Senator today to suggest that Senator Hawley should resign um, for you know, not just his responsibility for what happened beforehand, but also for you know, even after Wednesday's events, still pushing the narrative and, and not backing down and not doing what you know, Senator Lankford and Senator Leffler to, to their credit did, which was actually withdraw their objections to certification after Wednesday's violence. Um, you know, I, I think we should not be nearly as timid when it comes to political remedies um, for members of the legislature at the state or federal level who are so grossly, you know, miscarrying the duties of their office. But we have been historically, and I think that's part of why, you know, so far it's been a minority of voices, not a majority of them. Yeah, and, and it's interesting too because you have the the you have people who again yeah, continued with the, the the stop the steal like right like what is what is their culpability and I I find that a bit tenuous but I think that uh, you have this, the the uh, state representative from West Virginia who's in the Capitol um, you know that that is uh, to me a very clear cut case um, of someone who could be removed uh, from from office or should or pressured to resign. I want to turn the conversation to the question of um, pardons. Even before Wednesday, um, the president was doing a lot of pardoning um, on his way out, and there is a bit of concern that there could be more pardons or self-pardon even on his way out. Um, can we talk a little bit about how that plays into um, accountability for what happened on Wednesday? Um, both for the president as well as for the rioters, because even if they're pardoned, are there kind of state analogs, that whole kind of query of questions? Right, back to the weird jurisdictional status of DC. Um, <laughs> so, so, so first things first, um, on the self-pardon question, I mean, let's just sort of, re obviously we have no precedent. Um, I think the general consensus is that the answer is no. Um, but the only way to actually test that, and, and you know, I think a lot of folks have pointed this out, um, is for a president to try it and then be prosecuted by the federal government, um, right? Like that's the only way you'd ever find an answer to that. And so the irony is that a self-pardon would actually almost be daring the Biden administration um, to indict Trump just because DOJ might not want to let that president just sit out there. Um, of course, the other problem for, for President Trump is that a pardon only extends to federal crimes. And at least for him, um, that does nothing to stop Cy Vance, the district attorney in Manhattan, um, from continuing with his investigations into Trump's finances, the foundation, et cetera. Um, 
But, you know, with regard to what happened in D.C. on Wednesday specifically, um, once again, here's a quirk about D.C. Um, almost all violations of the D.C. code are violations of federal law um, and therefore fall within the president's, not the mayor's pardon power. So could the president um, issue some kind of blanket pardon for any offense that was committed on Wednesday? Constitutionally, I actually think the answer is yes. Um, and that would be yet another reason to impeach him or, you know, or disable him under the 25th Amendment, either before he could do that or right after he does it. Cammy, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, you know, it, except for, uh, again, uh, the, the uh, pr presidential pardon power, that is that is something we have, uh, you know, the Constitution allows the, the president to, to make these pardons. But um, it's it's very disturbing um, when uh, you've had a very, you know, a long uh, federal investigation, uh, like, like in the case of the, the Blackwater uh, contractors and, and the, the violence and, and uh, everything that we saw there. And again, it just, it, it just begs the question of, um, you know, for, for whom uh, is, is the criminal law? It's, it's, it has, it's traditionally reserved for, though, if you're not, a, you know, a, a friend or a contributor uh, of, of this uh, president, then you, you may not have uh, been able to get that power. So I really worry about the long-term damage that um, it's done uh, to our institutions and, and to, uh, to the rule of law and, and just a, a wide swath um, of our country, not the folks that we saw uh, on January twenty uh, on January sixth, but uh, a lot of Black and Brown communities who uh, you know are not able to, um, to to benefit from from this and and, and the the damage um, that's being done there and the illegitimacy with which uh, those communities uh, see uh, the criminal justice system is again something that we we have to take up. Just so just following up on this conversation a little bit more, um, this is an audience of lawyers. So there are lots of government attorneys, I'm sure, who are on this call today. And if you were kind of that government attorney who is now being asked to prepare pardon papers, are there kind of concerns that you would have uh, at this point for your own kind of culpability? Oh, that's a big one. Uh, I, I almost want to punt to Cam because I don't really want to answer that, but I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, so listen, everyone has to keep their own counsel about their ethics and their morals, and it's not my place to tell you what your ethics and morals are. Um, I, I do think and I do hope that folks who are in the government and are asked in the next 12 days to do things that go against their conscience and their morals, you know, think about whether there's a mechanism for them to actually push back against the action through channels. Um, and if not, think seriously about whether, you know, abiding something that, with which they so vehemently disagree um, is worth maintaining their current position. Um, you know, I'm, I am not a fan of the, of the senior Trump officials who have only just now found what I think Secretary DeVos called her inflection point. Um, but, you know, line, rank and file folks who have been trying their best for four years to just do their jobs and keep their heads down are a different class and a different question altogether. So, you know, I... It, it, I, I hope folks aren't put in that impossible situation, but when you are, you know, I just, I just hope that they don't fear the consequences for actually putting their morals ahead of their orders. Yeah, just, in, I mean, in terms of the ethical obligations uh, of lawyers, you know, if you believe that you've been asked to do something that is that is a violation of, of ethics, there are, you know, the DOJ still has an, an ethics office, <laughs> right, um, uh, to, you know, to, to ask these questions. But again, the fact that we are, the fact you're questioning uh, so much is, 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 is really the issue that, that this that these four years have led us to this point to question whether or not the, the mechanisms and the systems that we have in place um, are, are, are going to be uh, adequate. I just want to bring us back as we're kind of closing out to um, something Cami was talking about in her remarks in terms of the, um, the racial inequities in, ter in terms of policing that we really saw come to a light on Wednesday. And just 
your thoughts on whether or not what we saw on Wednesday can kind of give momentum for some comprehensive reform of law enforcement to address the racial biases and inequities that we've seen for a long time? You know, I, here here's the, the thing. We have uh, the, the George Floyd um, was a it, it 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 was you know a horrible thing for people to see uh, on to, to happen and for people to see. But there are many George Floyds that preceded George Floyd. So um, I you know the the momentum that we've seen these um, tr these uh, uh, aggressions have happened in communities of color for decades. Um, and so this is not new. We have the tools to uh, address uh, police violence and police accountability. Um, there's the uh, section, um, the pattern of practice authority that the uh, United States government has that uh, the Trump administration did not uh, enforce at all in the four years that he was in office. And so it was vigorously used under the Obama administration. We hope to see um, the ability of the federal government to uh, work with local uh, local police departments, uh, figure out uh, the unconstitutional violations, the patterns that are happening, and figure out uh, appropriate uh, remedies. And the communities should be involved. But um, again, th these, this is not new. We have the tools. We know what to do. We have not had the political will to do it. And this precedes uh, the, the the Trump administration, unfortunately. And I'll just I'll just piggyback on that to say I actually think what happened on Tuesday is more important than what happened on Wednesday when it comes to meaningful law enforcement reform. And by that I mean the Georgia runoffs, um, because you know I think there's a, a much greater chance of some kind of meaningful legislation getting through Congress with the Democratic majority, with you know at least a nominal Democratic majority in the Senate and with the Democratic president than even even than there was last summer when there was such a groundswell for it. Um, and, and as importantly, I think this is the really interesting, you know, long-term political question. Um, you know, Steve Schmidt, who was, I think, John McCain's uh, campaign manager in 2008, he tweeted that, you know, this is going to, this is going to fracture the Republican party, right? Between the sort of the, the Trumpist wing of the Republican party and the less Trumpist wing of the Republican party. And the question is whether in a Biden administration, you know, there are going to be efforts to try to keep some of the less Trumpy Republicans on board with some kinds of these reforms, right? Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski. Um, and if not, is that could be enough to convince Joe Manchin to agree to blow up the filibuster? Like, I mean, I just think, you know, a lot of what Cammy's talking about is possible at the federal level, if and only if there's a real effort on the part of the Democrats to push this through as a, as a, as a policy agenda. Well, we are running out of time. I just want to give both of you a chance if there's any kind of concluding thoughts or things you wanted to get across that we haven't covered. I think uh, what, what I would say um, to close is just um, the fact that, again, emphasizing that what we saw um, on, on Capitol Hill was a systemic failure. You know, um, I, I know that, that uh, Stephen Sun has, has, has resigned. I know that there are uh, more resignations within the Capitol Police uh, to, to um, you know, maybe forthcoming. Um, but uh, we, again, we have to have um, an investigation or commission to figure out uh, because these failures, they, it, it wasn't just something that happened on Wednesday, the intelligence failures, which again, I'm not even sure that I believe that they, that they didn't know that something like this um, uh, was afoot, but the, the lack of preparedness caused um, a lack of, uh, it caused uh, deaths. And uh, also, um, how do we look now to um, uh, other, uh, other nations and, and to know that it was possible to breach the Capitol in that way with our legislators inside. So we have to uh, take this up on so many, um, so many different levels. And I just say, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to repeat myself. The, the only thing I would say is, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about sort of theories of executive power in, in law schools um, and in, in common law classrooms. Um, and I think we've seen as transparently as we ever could um, the dangers of what has been the, the, the sexiest theory of executive power among conservatives for the last 30 years, which is the unitary executive. Um, Right, which is that if you take the unitary executive to its full stopping point, there's almost no mechanism to stop a president from doing what the president did on Wednesday. Um, and that, you know, if anything, hopefully the events of the last few days, if not the last few years, 
allow us to reinvigorate a serious conversation about better distributing the powers between the political branches as opposed to allowing so much to drift to the executive. Well, with that, I just want to thank um, Professor Vladek and Professor Shavis so much for being with us today. This was a really fantastic conversation. As, as Steve, you said at the top of your remarks, I wish it was under better circumstances. Um, these are really tough days for our country, but we're grateful that we could all come together today to have this forum and to discuss the legal issues at play. Um, so thanks again and see everyone. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Cammie. And, and thanks to everybody who, who, who watched. Looks like we had a good audience.